Thank you very much, Ellen. There are some other people that I do want to thank. First and foremost, my parents, Andy and Henry at 11. Thank you so much for being here. Pretty easy uh, drive for you. Live right down the street, so thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, our law enforcement that's here. Can we give them a round of applause for the work that they do? Thank you, guys. Uh, and I want to thank everybody here at San Juan Hills High School. What an amazing school this is, as part of the Capital Unified School District. Thanks to our great trustee, Amy Hanacek, who's here. Isn't Capital Unified doing a great job? I think they are. I'm biased, though, because my wife and I have kids in Capital Unified School District. Uh, I want to say to the students uh, here today and all those who are watching online, we're, we're streaming this online as well, uh, you are our future, and we are doing this for you. And every time that I uh, vote on legislation in Washington, uh, I am always mindful of how it will impact the next generation. Uh, and my hope is that our Congress and those who are serving in Washington will leave this world a little bit better than we found it. And as I mentioned, I have a, a six-year-old and a five-year-old at home, so I always think about uh, the future that we're leaving for them. And that's what we've tried to do. I figured that I would give you a brief overview of this, uh, just some of the things that we've done uh, in about 100 days, now a little more than 100 days since I was sworn in in January, uh, with key priorities that I wanted to highlight for students and for the next generation, uh, but also for our district. Uh, first, I was proud to co-sponsor our very first piece of legislation, top priority in the new Congress, uh, which is known as the For the People Act, or H.R. 1. The bill would expand voting rights. It would make Election Day a federal holiday. It would reduce the influence of big money in politics. It would make it harder for foreign entities to interfere in our elections. All things that I think are critical. I'm proud that we passed H.R. 1 in the House. You didn't hear nearly enough about it in my opinion. And I implore Mitch McConnell and the Senate to have hearings and to take it up for a vote in the Senate. And if they're serious about trying to reduce the foreign interference in our elections, they would vote, they would take this bill up, they'd vote on it, they'd have hearings on it, and we'd have a serious discussion about it. Uh, next, I wanted to talk about the Equality Act. I'm a proud co-sponsor of the Equality Act, H.R. 5. It prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex, gender identity, and sexual orienta uh, orientation. And the House will be voting on the Equality Act very soon, and I hope the Senate will follow suit. I've also co-sponsored my friend Joe Kennedy, uh, his resolution expressing opposition to banning service in the armed forces by openly transgender individuals. I think Congress should do everything it can to discourage the Department of Defense, or for that matter, anyone else, from discriminating against the LGBTQ community. And we owe that to the next generation. I was very proud to co-sponsor the Dream and Promise Act, or H.R. 6, which would allow nearly 700,000 DACA recipients, as well as another 1.6 million eligible dreamers brought to America as children to stay in the U.S. I'm hopeful we'll be voting on that as well. The reality is that we need to treat immigrants with dignity and respect. Uh, just as my mom's parents, when they came from Mexico, uh, many years ago were treated with dignity and respect. That's what I hope for the next generation of immigrants. And yes, we need comprehensive immigration reform and it ought to be done on a bipartisan basis. Let's get back to the table and let's make things happen. I also co-sponsored the Bipartisan Background Checks Act, also known as H.R. 8 which would require background checks for all gun sales nationwide. And I want to thank the students, you students here and across the country for leading on the issue of gun violence prevention. You know, obviously we've had a very difficult week. Uh, we had a shooting at the Chabad in Poway. Uh, our friends in San Diego were deeply impacted by that. I spoke last night at the largest temple in the district uh, to the south of here. Uh, and it was a very powerful evening, uh, one of reflection and hopefulness for the future. Uh, we also saw the attack at UNC Charlotte uh, as well. And I think it's up to each and every one of us, elected officials, but more importantly, everyday citizens, including students, 
uh, to confront the hate and the bigotry that persists in our society. And at the same time, I also believe we need to take strong and decisive action to end the epidemic of gun violence in our country, and I'll keep working to do that. And I hope you work with me to do it. I also wanted to talk about another issue uh, that impacts everyone here and that students are leading on, uh, on more than anybody, and that's climate change. I've been working on the issue of climate change my entire professional career, and I was honored when Speaker Pelosi uh, named me to the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. I'm one of the three freshmen on that uh, with my friend Jonah Goose of Colorado and Sean Kasten of Illinois. I'm also one of the three Californians on the committee. Uh, and it really is a great uh, place to begin thinking about how we're gonna solve the crisis. We passed our first comprehensive piece of climate legislation in the House, H.R. 9, last week. We finally passed something related to climate. It didn't make nearly the news. It was a little bit of a busy news week uh, last week. But nonetheless, H.R. 9 recommits America to the Paris Climate Agreement and it demands that the president come up with a plan to address climate change. We've got to begin the process of recognizing the science and stop denying that this is happening and begin to accept the scientific consensus. And you might be aware that we're doing a lot of other things as well. Uh, many of you have worked on the Carbon Fee and Dividend Act. I'm a proud co-sponsor of that, uh, as well as a co-sponsor of the Green New Deal, which I know many of the students are very familiar with, and I have to tell you, I've never seen so much misinformation about a resolution in my entire career. I reread the resolution, and there wasn't anything about eliminating airplanes or destroying buildings or uh, getting rid of hamburgers. I didn't see any of that. What I did see was a bold vision uh, for sustainability uh, and to dramatically reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And the reality is this, we already have a Green New Deal in California. We've been living it for the last couple of decades, and we know that you can protect the environment, you can combat climate change, you can advance vehicle electrification, you can improve building efficiency, you can increase renewable energy production, all at the same time as you grow the economy. And don't let anybody ever tell you that you cannot protect the environment and grow the economy at the same time because we've done it in California and we can do it in the nation as, as a whole if only we have the vision to think boldly and to embrace the future rather than double down on the dirty energy technologies of the past. And I thank the students for leading the way uh, when we think about climate change. Thank you very much. I've also been fighting hard for clean air and clean water, and I co-sponsored two bills to prevent drilling off the California coast. You don't want to see drilling off the coast, do you? No. And speaking of the coast, I've been leading on efforts to get the nuclear waste off the coast at San Onofre once and for all. I hope that I get asked a question about this because I could go on all night about San Onofre. Uh, but I'll just uh, very quickly summarize. We have a task force that's been uh, meeting now and is developing a strategy to deal with the waste, it requires a multifaceted approach to transportation planning uh, to figure out where we're going to site and permit uh, and license uh, either an interim or a permanent storage facility, uh, while at the same time figuring out how we're going to safely move the waste that's still in the spent fuel pool into canisters that actually are safe enough to handle it and can transport the waste across the country. All those things have to happen. And I'm hopeful that we can prioritize, in fact, I have a bill that would prioritize the movement of spent nuclear fuel at those sites that have higher population density. You might be aware that around San Onofre, if you look at a 50 mile radius, there are 8.3 million people that live within a 50 mile radius of San Onofre. And we also have seismic risk. We have two active earthquake faults and a whole network of inactive earthquake faults around San Onofre. I want to prioritize those sites with more people and higher seismic risk. We're working on legislation that would do just that, and it should be a bipartisan effort. Uh, and it's got to be, because we've got to get that waste off the coast. And on a different note, just a few weeks ago, and this is something that I know is very interesting to many of the students, I was proud to co-sponsor the, the Save the Internet Act. 
1644, which would restore net neutrality. Because I believe you shouldn't have to sign up for a more expensive data package simply because you want to use Instagram or Snapchat or whatever it is that y'all are using. I use Twitter far too much, kind of like the president, too much Twitter. So next I want to talk about an issue that doesn't make it to cable news. Uh, you don't see it on Fox or CNN or MSNBC, uh, at least not enough, but it's nonetheless really important to me and important to this district. And that's my work and the work that we do generally in Congress on a bipartisan basis for veterans. Uh, the Speaker and uh, the leadership of the Veterans Affairs Committee, they were uh, incredibly gracious to uh, allow me to have a chairmanship. I'm the chair of the Veterans Affairs Subcommittee on Economic Opportunity. And just this past week, we passed a dozen bipartisan bills through our subcommittee uh, that are going to, in many different ways, improve veterans' housing, help them deal with homelessness, expand GI Bill benefits, uh, help with scholarships and services for more service members and their families. And this is something that makes me very proud, that we can give back just a little bit to those who give so much uh, to our country. And I'm eager that uh, many of these bills, I don't know how many of the 12, but a good number of them, are going to pass the House, the full House, they're going to pass the Senate. This is bipartisan stuff, it really does happen. And then they're going to get signed by the President of the United States into law, and I'll be glad uh, when I have one of those bill certificates with the President's signature, because we actually do get things done on a bipartisan basis uh, in Washington. Uh, whether it's on uh, veterans' issues or San Onofre, there's a whole host of things that we're working on together, but unfortunately it doesn't always get reported. Now, I do want to talk for just a minute about what always is being reported, and that's uh, what I think a, a number of you are interested in. Uh, that's the uh, Mueller report and uh, Mr. Barr and all the recent events of the past week, because what we have to do in Congress is sort of walk and chew gum at the same time. The most important thing that I can do in Congress is work on a bipartisan basis to help the residents of this district and this community. And that's my first priority when I'm there. But I'm also mindful of the oath of office that I took on January 3rd. All 435 members of the House took the same oath. We said the same words, that we were going to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Not that we were going to protect and defend a political party. Not that we were going to protect and defend a president. But under Article 1, we're going to ensure, as the U.S. House of Representatives, that the rule of law applies to everyone in the country the same, including the President of the United States, including the Attorney General. And I saw Attorney General Barr's testimony both on April 9th before the Appropriations Committee when he was asked about his interactions with Mueller's team, and then more recently before the Senate. I was very disappointed that he did not testify before the House last Thursday. Uh, and I think that it is correct to hold him in contempt if he fails to produce. We, we've issued a subpoena for the unredacted Mueller report. And it is important that we get the unredacted Mueller report. And if we don't, I believe the contempt of Congress path is the right path. Uh, and I also believe that if the Attorney General, if Mr. Barr is more interested in being the President's lawyer, than the people's lawyer, because the Attorney General of the United States is not supposed to be the President's personal attorney. And if he's interested in doing that, I think he should resign as Attorney General and go be the President's personal per attorney and at least be honest about it. I think it's important that Bob Mueller testifies before Congress so that we can ask him some critical questions about both what was in the report and what wasn't in the report. And I hope you've had a chance to read the report. I have twice, forward to back, 448 pages, uh, you don't have to read the whole thing, read the summary. I think uh, your teachers should probably make you read the summary as part of your uh, AP classes, uh, because I think it's important that you understand uh, what Mr. Mueller said and what he didn't say. Uh, in part two, volume two, there were 10 instances uh, where the special counsel outlined potential interference in the investigation, and he issued uh, a three-part test. He said there's a three-part test for obstruction. By my reading, at least four of the ten instances met the three-part criteria for obstruction. So I think that's significant. He also said he wouldn't make a traditional prosecutorial judgment as the special counsel. But he also specifically said 
that the president was not exonerated. Those are the facts. Go read them. If you don't agree or if you don't believe me, go read them for yourself. That's what he said. So we need to understand why Mr. Mueller wouldn't reach that traditional prosecutorial judgment. I think this paragraph is also very important. Uh, page 370 of the PDF, quote, the president's efforts to influence the investigation were mostly unsuccessful, but that is largely because the persons who surrounded the president declined to carry out his orders. So here's the bottom line. You're not exonerated from obstruction of justice just because you don't succeed at obstructing justice. It's the intent uh, that is really important. Mr. Mueller makes clear multiple times that there was a lot of intent. And accordingly, as a Congress, we must continue to act. And Mueller says this, Congress has the authority to prohibit a president's corrupt use of his authority in order to protect the integrity of the administration of justice. Congress must act. Uh, additionally, we now know of the president's reaction when Mueller was appointed to be special counsel. He wasn't very happy about it. And I'm a strong believer uh, that we need to get to the bottom of what happened, but we also need to take it one step at a time. So I plan to follow the facts. And where our president is very quick to be impulsive, I think we need to be quick, or we, not, we need to not be so quick. We need to be deliberative. We're a deliberative body. We need to hold hearings. We need to also understand those things that Mueller doesn't talk about. Things like uh, the financial entanglements with Russia or Deutsche Bank. Things like the potential emoluments violations and self-enrichment. Uh, and things like uh, the president not being willing to release his tax records. We need to understand more before we reach a final conclusion. But I will tell you this, no president is above the law. Simple as that. And that's the oath that I took. And I hope that my colleagues on both sides of the aisle should not be a partisan thing. We all took the same oath. Again, to protect and defend what? The Constitution, not a political party, not a president. Does that make sense? So we've been pretty busy, wouldn't you say? We've had a lot on our plate. And again, we're trying to walk and chew gum at the same time while we're there. Uh, so with that, I'd like to turn it over and get to as many of your questions as possible. I will be sticking around after for those whose questions are not answered. Uh, I would recommend that uh, if for whatever reason you don't get to ask me the question or you don't uh, interact with me after that you meet with one of our staff. If you're on our team, can you raise your hand? I see Blake over there, Adam in the back. I think Hunter's in the back over there. Ellen's around somewhere. There are lots of people here. Connect with one of them. Let them know who you are, what your concerns are and we'll be happy to address them. Also, we have uh, our district office in Dana Point. Now, the good news is we actually have a staff there, right? So, like, the door is open. Uh, we want to hear from you. We want to see you. Uh, if you have concerns in the community, we want to know about them. And you never know how our office might be able to help. Uh, I am constantly amazed at the, the ways that our office is able to help those in the community. So please do take us up on it. So in terms of the rules of the Q&A, there aren't very many of them. But uh, as Ellen said, I think everybody has 60 seconds to ask their question. Uh, and I look forward to taking as many questions as possible. So, Ellen, why don't we begin? By the way, I want to thank our team that did the sound and the lighting, Andy and the crew. They did a great job, right? And I told them I would thank them. <laughs> thank you, guys. So what you'll do is you can either, if you're in the front, you come here. If you're in the back, go around the side. So while everybody's lining up, I'll say this, we're, we're doing these house parties one a month. We've got another one coming up in June.
July, August, September, etc. We're also starting up our house parties again. During the campaign, we did 197 of them. And I want to do as many as I can. I don't know if we're going to get to do another 197. My team might not be very happy about that. But at least one, uh, one a week, when we're not doing a town hall, we'll be doing a house party, uh, and hopefully more than that. Uh, if you're interested in volunteering, Blake Morris is back there, our new field director. Not, he was our Orange County field director, now he's our field director, period. He's doing an amazing job. And Hunter in the back, our political director as well. So please come uh, speak with him if you're interested. Um, Hi, Linda, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Where do you live? I live in Dana Point. Great. So my question is, where are you planning to put the nuclear waste from San Onofre Power Plant? So this is a great question. Uh, I think the greatest likelihood right now today, if I could predict, and I don't have a, a complete crystal ball on this, is we would create an interim storage site in West Texas. And why is that? That's because that's where Rick Perry, the Secretary of Energy, wants to see it. And I never thought I would agree with Secretary Rick Perry so much, but I know it needs to get out of California. We, in 1982, we had the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, and we had, as part of that, uh, nine potential permanent storage facilities all around the country. That was narrowed down to two and then one. That one is Yucca Mountain. Uh, then over the years, Yucca Mountain became both politically and uh, geologically uh, not uh, the most preferred place. I'd like to go see it with my own eyes. That's how I uh, try to do things is, you know, before commenting, I actually want to go see it myself. There are some of my colleagues that still very much want to pursue Yucca Mountain. There are others that still do not want to pursue Yucca Mountain. Uh, in the meantime, in, you know, at the same time, I think we have to look at a, an interim storage site. And I've asked the um, Department of Energy through the appropriations process to spend $25 million on uh, figuring out the, the interim storage piece, siting, permitting, and licensing. Now, if we, let's say we pick uh, West Texas as the site. Uh, there's also New Mexico that's a, another potential, but I, I'm a big believer in consent-based uh, nuclear waste storage, meaning I want to see that uh, local and state stakeholders want it there, not just politicians in Washington, D.C. Uh, I think, based on what I've heard and based on what I've seen, that folks in Texas are more amenable to it. And so then we'd have to figure out how to get it from here to there. By the time we're done moving everything into canisters, there's going to be well over 130 canisters filled with nuclear waste. Getting it from here to there requires every state along the way to agree. The Western Governors Association has begun this work. There's still a long way to go. But every single state is going to probably want it to go in a different part of the state or not in their state. So we have to work that out. The most likely scenario is that it will go on rail lines from here to there. Um, and you could rail it, you could truck it, or you could send it uh, via the ocean. Sending it via the ocean is gonna be really tough. Trucking it is gonna be really tough. And then the other question is how long it's gonna take. What they tell me is that they can probably do three or four canisters at a time on a rail line. And so uh, it also takes time for the, the uh, fuel assemblies to cool uh, long enough to be able to transport them. By Edison's timetable, they wouldn't even begin moving the waste off-site until 2035. They wouldn't end until 2050. I think through our prioritization bill, siting, permitting, and licensing of an interim storage site, and coming up with some regional transportation planning, we ought to be able to shave 10 years off of that, or 15 years off of that, so that we begin moving the waste off in 2028, and it would end in 2035. That's what I want to see. I want to be alive when it's gone. Uh, and I think everybody wants that as well. So thank you very much for the question. Excellent question. And if those are interested, we have a task force on this. Come and ask me after. Thank you very much. Full disclosure, I'm not a student of San Juan Hills. <laughs> <laughs> but, we, you know, Larry Kramer is a former San Juan council member, and he's doing a lot of great stuff. Thank you for being here, Larry. Hey, we appreciate you. you. I am very grateful that you are a congressman and you're so open and you're doing all these town halls. I think that's fantastic. And I want to thank you for sponsoring the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. My question is, how hopeful are you that the world can minimize this climate crisis for future generations? I'm hopeful because of you. Because you represent the next generation and you want to see bold and aggressive measures taken. 
so that you actually have a habitable planet. And I think that Washington politicians are way behind the general public, but in particular behind uh, the next generation when it comes to dealing with climate change. And when I hear and I see all the incredible activism and momentum out there, uh, that gives me a lot of hope. Uh, when we passed H.R. 9 in the Congress uh, this past week, I saw student activists all week uh, that were lobbying for that, that were out at transit stops with Climate Action Now signs, and that gives me hope as well. Uh, my uh, concern is that the fossil fuel industry, a handful of oil companies in particular, and a couple of coal companies, have too many politicians uh, bought. And that's politicians of both parties. Uh, if we're going to get away from coal and oil as the backbone of our energy infrastructure over time, and we're going to uh, move towards more sustainable and cleaner solutions, uh, then we're going to have to have campaign finance reform. Uh, so I'm a big advocate for those measures that were part of HR1, uh, along trying to get the dark money uh, out of political campaigns. I'm also proud of the fact uh, that we take no corporate PAC money for our campaign, and that we take no fossil fuel money for our campaign. And there are a lot of my colleagues that have done the same. If we're going to solve the climate crisis through the political system that we've got today, it's going to require campaign finance reform, and it's going to require listening to the next generation. But I think we can do it. Thanks, Larry. Um, can I get ticket 054 to come line up to you, please? Thank you. Uh, my name is Leslie. I live in San Clemente. Hi, Leslie. How are you? I'm well. Um, all right. Uh, mine is a little bit of a twofer. For one is a take-home question. Uh, so the take-home question <laughs> is, what issue are you willing to lose your seat fighting for? So you can think about that, and we'll circle up next time. But I actually know the answer. I just said it. The okay. Constitution of the United States. Got it. And I can expand on that. But go okay. Ahead. That's a answer. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, now, my main question is, what are you personally doing to mitigate the child abuse at the southern border? Thank you for the question. So, I'm going to be meeting with Magdalena, who's uh, replacing uh, Nielsen. And um, I'm going to have some tough questions for him. Uh, my belief is that there are good people across the aisle that actually are just as concerned by this. I know they are, because I talked to them. Uh, I went and I visited the border recently, the uh, Port of San Isidro, uh, and it will break your heart when you see uh, children uh, and families, legitimate asylum seekers, who come to the border uh, fleeing political persecution or violence. Uh, they're not trying to come for any other reason but to try to uh, be safe and to improve the quality of their life and their uh, family's life. Uh, and the fact that we had a policy that separated thousands of children uh, from their parents, uh, for me, uh, undermines the values that I believe our country uh, to be about. Uh, and I think that uh, there's agreement, including from a lot of my Republican colleagues, on that. Uh, I can tell you that I'll be asking McAleenan uh, what he's doing personally to prevent that from occurring, uh, and what he's also going to do to reunite the still thousands who are separated. Uh, I, what I did see with my own eyes uh, was tragic, but it was also humane. Uh, I saw families that were kept together uh, at the Port of San Isidro uh, in detention. Uh, the other thing that people need to realize is we've got the biggest port of entry by far uh, just at uh, San Isidro, you know, just to the south of here, about a two-hour drive from here. Uh, it's a uh, huge and expensive port of entry. $800 million was recently spent, uh, and uh, 95,000 people a day cross through that port of entry. Virtually all of them are completely uh, safe. They, in other words, they've already gotten their the equivalent of a TSA pre-check because they're coming back and forth for business or tourism or whatever it may be. There's a very, very small number of them that they hold for secondary questioning, uh, and a smaller number of them still that they find are engaged in any sort of criminal activity. Those that are, are uh, gone. Uh, and I asked how many gangs and drugs and things like that do you see? Gang members, very few. So it's inaccurate, at least at the Port of San Isidro. There are 328 ports, of which the Port of San Isidro is the biggest one. 
uh, how many drugs do you see coming through? There are a lot of drugs, but they're coming through the port and they're being stopped at the port of San Isidro effectively because they have personnel and scanning and technology. The same kind of technology I believe we need all across the southern border. And we know what works because it, it is working today at the port of San Isidro. It costs a lot of money. We need that kind of uh, resources across the, the southern border, and we go a long way towards solving the problem. I'm going to go a little long because I want to address your other question. I've thought about it a lot in terms of why am I in Congress? What am I supposed to be doing? And I go back to our Constitution again and again uh, because it's ultimately more important to me that I do right by the country and the Constitution than by a political party uh, or politics of the moment. So rather than getting engaged in a partisan food fight back and forth, I think it's really critical that we stick to the Article uh, 1 that governs how we are supposed to legislate and do our jobs uh, and what the Constitution says. And again, what that means is that the rule of law has to apply to everybody across the board, uh, including the President of the United States and the Attorney General. That's my compass. That's my driving force. And I'm very hopeful that we'll be able to look back. You know, I have a six-year-old and five-year-old at home that when they're my age, when they want to understand why their dad did what he did or didn't do what he didn't do, it's because of what the Constitution said. It's because of what the laws of the United States uh, guided me to do or not do. And for that, that's more important than politics. So thank you very much for your question. the nature of our politics today hurts the country <clears throat> when we worry about uh, whether any president uh, may or may not have uh, uh, had conduct and not becoming of a president. That hurts the country. When we have the toxic rhetoric, whether it's uh, the rhetoric as it's reported by the press or when I hear uh, in the halls of Congress uh, people upset with one another, that harms the country. Uh, the, the type of divisiveness and toxicity that I've seen which I think, unfortunately, a lot of it does come from the top down. I believe that uh, to be the case. That hurts the country. What I think ultimately helps is when we have checks and balances, uh, when we have the rule of law, uh, and when we follow uh, where the Constitution uh, leads us. And ultimately what that means uh, is that we have an obligation. I have a duty and an obligation uh, to the Constitution. So uh, I think ultimately that over time will heal the country, uh, but it's not going to be easy. There's going to be some bumps in the road from here to there. Uh, there's some very heavy stuff in the Mueller report, as I said, 10 instances in volume two of potential obstruction, of which I would argue four of the 10, at least, all three elements of obstruction were met. Uh, and then obviously there's a lot that the Mueller report didn't cover. So uh, for me, as I think for many of my colleagues, this is one where we're taking it literally one day at a time. We're watching Mr. Barr very closely. We're seeing how he reacted, reacts to our subpoena uh, for the unredacted report because ultimately for me to make a complete determination on what to do, uh, even though I'm not on one of the committees of direct jurisdiction, I'm not on oversight or judiciary or intelligence, uh, I nonetheless get a vote uh, if uh, we move forward on a uh, action against Mr. Barr to hold him in contempt of Congress, then ultimately if the Judiciary Committee moves forward with that, the entire Congress will then vote on that. Uh, so I'm watching it very closely. I don't like to see the games on either side. Uh, I think this is far too serious a matter uh, for us to be playing politics with them. I thank you for the question.
Great. College at Indiana University. At Indiana University. Yeah. Go Hoosiers. Yeah. All right. Uh, so Welcome home. About education. Yes. So, there's a lot of different ideas being thrown around about how we can solve like, this debt crisis and just making education more cheaper. So yep. We're talking about just paying off the college debt. Others are talking about working on solutions to actually lower tuition rates. What ideas do you think we should be pushing for, and should the government be involved in lowering the price of college costs? So. Uh, excellent question. Congratulations on uh, Indiana University. Uh, we have a massive student loan bubble waiting to burst in the country, a trillion and a half dollars. Uh, and we have far too many who, by the time they graduate from college, are up to their ears in debt to the point where their career choices are very limited. And we do need to make sure that if you go to college, first of all, that you can afford to go. Uh, and second, that you have uh, the ability to go get a decent job when you graduate in a field that you're passionate about, that you want to pursue, including public service positions. So I have advocated, uh, and I'll continue to advocate, for solutions that aim to eliminate tuition and fees in in-state four-year public universities. Uh, and I've said that families that make up to $125,000 per year, I think their uh, kids uh, ought to be able to uh, get a break to be able to go to college. Uh, I also would make community college tuition free for all income levels. And I also think we need to do a whole lot more with apprenticeship programs. Uh, good union apprenticeship programs that pay a decent wage. Earlier today, actually this morning, I got to uh, spend time with the uh, electrical workers down in San Diego and they have an amazing apprenticeship program where you can make a living wage. There was a young man that I met uh, who just graduated from Cal State Long Beach uh, with a political science degree, so he was very interested in talking about politics, but he went to become an electrician. And he's making right off the bat enough money uh, to begin to pay off uh, his student loans. Uh, so I think we have to, there's not one thing that's going to solve the problem. I think we've got to have uh, a, uh, a balanced approach uh, where we're mindful of the need to uh, treat public schools and public teachers as the hero that they are. I believe the public universities uh, and public community colleges need to be the backbone of our educational system. I also have been doing a lot of work to protect veterans, because again, the Veterans Economic Opportunity Committee that I chair, a subcommittee that I chair, uh, I am very concerned about uh, predatory lending, and, or I should say uh, predatory uh, educational institutions who are uh, forcing veterans to, to take out loans without fully realizing the consequences of those loans. Uh, we've seen a number of instances where they use the GI Bill uh, improperly, and then those institutions will actually shut down as a result. Uh, so I think we need to uh, ultimately uh, treat public schools and public teachers as the heroes that they are. I think Betsy DeVos has done a disservice to public education. I think like many in the Trump administration, she desires privatization of our public institutions. Uh, and I think we need to fight against that. And I think we need to stand up for great teachers uh, like the ones here who are ultimately uh, doing uh, an amazing job, in many cases can't afford to live in the communities that they're working. I was just speaking with our law enforcement, they have the same problem. Our nurses have the same problem, our firefighters have the same problem. It weakens our communities when the people who are serving uh, our schools and serving uh, in law enforcement, public safety, when they can't afford to live in the communities in which they work, that weakens our communities. So I want to do all I can to rebuild that basic backbone, that middle class backbone that starts with the great opportunity to have a great education at a public school or university. So I thank you for the question. The next questions that we're taking are going to be from ticket 058 and from 050. Uh, hi, Mr. Hi there. I'm Kieran Moriarty. Uh, I grew up in Ladera Ranch, and Great. I go to UC Santa Cruz now. All right. And my question is about housing, because where I go to school, I have classmates that are either living in their cars, living in tents, or paying like absorbent, you know, fees for housing, you know, fifteen, a hundred, a thousand dollars a month just to live in like a shack. But um, so my question is, what in particular are you going to do? help lower the cost of housing, because this is a nationwide problem, not just in Santa Cruz, although we must be most severely affected by it. So I think about this constantly. It's a local, state, and federal issue, and all three have to work well together. And every locality is different. 
So what works in San Juan isn't going to work for Dana Point, isn't going to work for San Clemente. And Ladera Ranch is already pretty well built out, although they're, I think they're continuing to build Ranch in Mission Viejo. Uh, we lack affordable housing all throughout my district. Uh, that is a reality. Uh, we also have a very long commutes. We have an average round trip of 54 minutes. The average resident of the 49th district has a very long commute. So I support all those efforts to build more what they call TOD, Transit Oriented Development. Uh, more housing near where people live, or excuse me, where people work, uh, or where the jobs are. There are efforts in Sacramento, and they're controversial. Uh, I'm following them closely. Uh, I'm also very mindful of what all 10 mayors, every mayor, I'm trying to meet with every mayor and every city manager, and the question I always ask is, what are you doing to build more affordable housing? I just had a chance to uh, visit an affordable complex in Carlsbad, 134 units, uh, two, three, and four bedrooms. The rents are anywhere from about 1,200 up to about 1,600, give or take, and they have a Head Start kindergarten built in uh, right there where uh, kids can go to school. Uh, there just aren't enough projects like that because of how complicated they are to build. Uh, I believe in extending the federal uh, low-income housing tax credit. We've got to make these projects pencil for private developers, right? So we have to make it appealing for those that are building the housing and want to build that type of housing. Uh, I'm specifically worried about veterans housing, again, because it's the jurisdiction of the subcommittee that I serve on. Uh, and there are a number of ways that uh, we build affordable housing for veterans. Uh, there's a program called HUD-BASH, uh, given through the Housing and Urban Development Department. Uh, right now, a veteran who qualifies for that program gets $1,200 a month. It's generally not enough uh, to buy a you know, market-based housing, which could be $2,000 for a one-bedroom. I think in our uh, district, about $1,900 is the average for a one-bedroom apartment. Uh, of course, it's worse than Santa Cruz. Uh, but uh, we need it all. We need to fully use SB1 and SB2 funds that are available uh, that also are a, a tool in the toolbox so that we can better leverage uh, federal and local resources to partner with. Every single affordable housing project that I've studied has a myriad of different sources of funding. Uh, they, in many cases, they'll use the tax equity uh, and the low-income housing tax credit, uh, and they'll partner with a variety of nonprofit agencies to provide services if, if services are needed. Uh, all of that together means it's complicated. There are some big ideas being discussed by the presidential candidates, uh, which I'm following closely as well. Uh, I think under this president, it's unlikely that we're going to see a lot of movement in that direction. Uh, but nonetheless, I think uh, we have to have support of tax policy, and we have to do everything we can at the local, state, and federal level working together. My office is ready to help in any way with anybody that has a good project that's ready to go and it's another issue that's bipartisan. Every mayor, if they're Republican, Democratic, they all want to see more affordable housing. So I thank you for the question. Hello, Mike. How are you? I'm good. I'm an interloper from Long Beach. All right. <laughs> A friend of mine invited me here. What's your name? I'll tell you later. OK. <laughs> certainly take a look at that. I think the, the key is, is that we've got to work on prescription drug pricing and uh, try to evaluate what we can do on a bipartisan basis today. Because I, I actually think that there are those on the other side of the aisle that want to work with us on this. I believe that wholeheartedly because they told me that they do. Uh, what that actually looks like, though, is a whole other matter. And when you have the insurance industry and the big drug companies that, like some of the big oil companies, are literally buying some of my colleagues, again, on both sides of the aisle, uh, it makes it very difficult to envision uh, real change. Uh, what I can tell you is that there are also a whole lot of different kinds of drugs. Some of them take way more time and money to develop. Some of them are developed for rare diseases. There are uh, things like uh, life sciences and biotechnology-derived uh, drugs, of which we've got a ton in our district. Uh, and I want to make sure that what we do also uh, maintains their ability to innovate and to form life-saving cures. So it is a, a balance that needs to occur. But we pay way too much 
for prescription drugs. Who here thinks they pay too much for prescription drugs? Amazing, amazing. So there's broad bipartisan support for doing something about it if we have the political will and the courage to work across the aisle, look the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical companies in the face and say, enough. We're paying more money in this country for worse outcomes, too much for prescription drugs, and you shouldn't have to choose between whether or not you get your medication or your dinner or your lunch. That's not how uh, the system was designed. I think it violates the basic bargain that has made this country uh, great in the first place, which is that if you work hard, 40 hours a week, you ought to be able to make ends meet, you ought to be able to retire with dignity, you ought to be able to afford prescription drugs uh, and afford your uh, cost of health care. I think health care is something uh, that is obviously on the top of mind of many of my colleagues in Congress. There's a whole variety of uh, potential uh, ways to deal with the tens of millions who remain uninsured uh, in the country. Uh, but my first priority is making sure that the continued attack on the Affordable Care Act ends. It needs to end in the court system. It needs to end in the halls of Congress. Uh, because for the Affordable Care Act to work effectively, uh, you've got to have the three legs of the stool, which means you have to bring back the individual mandate. You have to make sure that we're doing every can everything we can for that uh, bill to, that law to act as it was intended to act. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle too, many of them uh, are engaged in trying to undermine the Affordable Care Act. And that needs to stop. And that's most, most recently been happening in the courts. So I was proud that uh, we uh, passed a resolution uh, in the House uh, to enable our uh, lawyers to be able to go and fight on behalf of the millions, tens of millions of Americans who rely on the Affordable Care Act. And we also have to protect those with pre-existing conditions because that is the backbone uh, of the ACA. And some on the other side want to do away with those protections and we will not allow it to happen. But thank you for the question very much. Thank you, Anne, for the question. Thank you for the work that you do. Uh, I am a co-sponsor of Medicare for All. I am also a supporter <laughs> of anything that will hopefully uh, cover more people with quality coverage that they can afford. It's a very simple principle. And the reality is right now, with this administration, this Congress, what we have to do is make sure that the ACA is not destroyed. Uh, they have tried. Uh, in the halls of Congress to undermine the ACA. They tried to pass the AHCA, which would have provided uh, disastrous results. It would have taken millions and millions of people uh, off uh, of health care altogether or given them plans that were uh, very poor, either the premiums being way too high or the coverage being way too weak. Uh, it put at risk 
millions of Americans with pre-existing conditions who put at risk a lot of young people uh, who need uh, that care and uh, who, who rely on the ACA and the protections that it provides. So the first order of business is preventing the wholesale destruction of the Affordable Care Act, both in Congress and in the courts. Uh, we're going to work to pass legislation, uh, I believe next week even, uh, that will try to stabilize the Affordable Care Act. As I mentioned, we already passed a resolution in the House uh, enabling the legal system to move forward to fight the lawsuit filed in Texas against the Affordable Care Act. Uh, I believe the Affordable Care Act was constitutional. Uh, I believe that those who uh, have tried to undermine it uh, know that their arguments are intellectually dishonest. I believe that they are bought uh, by a handful of uh, big insurance companies and other special interests who want to see uh, their profits go up at the expense of quality and affordable coverage for millions of Americans. Uh, long term, uh, you're absolutely right. I will do whatever we can to try uh, to achieve quality and affordable health care for as many people as we can. The prescription drug issue is one that I do think we can get bipartisan support on. I just know that from talking to my colleagues. They want to see it happen as well, uh, many on the other side of the aisle. So we've got a lot of work to do, but I'm hopeful we can do it. Some of the things are going to uh, be uh, stopgap measures in the next 18 months to prevent more damage from being done. Other things are going to have to play out in the courts and then still other things are longer term uh, depending on who the next President of the United States is and what the composition of the Congress is in years ahead. Uh, but the key is we've got to keep at it. We've just got to keep at it. And all the input that I can get from folks in the profession such as yourself, doctors, nurses and others, that's incredibly valuable because I take that with me to Washington. And I tell my colleagues what I heard, including what you just said. That's what I'm going to tell them this, this coming week. I have more to say, but we can talk later. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you for the question. Good afternoon, Congressman. Um, my name is John Cody Chauffeur. I'm a sophomore at San Clemente High School. And right. my question kind of looks like, it kind of looks up where? Okay, so it wouldn't be unreasonable to say that our political system in this country is somewhat flawed, and we're, an issue that I'm kind of looking at is our redistricting laws, because congressmen, they will redraw the districts just so that they can get reelected, and Americans are forced to vote for candidates who don't really represent their community. So how would you plan to fight gerrymandering in the state and nationwide? Great question, and if you look at H.R. 1 that we passed, it includes provisions on this very matter. It would uh, basically expand. Everybody knows how we do it in California? We have an independent citizens redistricting commission, and it's specifically not designed to protect incumbents. You all realize that, right? This is wildly different than is done in many other states. Uh, I was just having dinner the other night with one, one of my colleagues from the state of New Jersey, their redistricting is done by 12 politicians or people that are appointed by politicians. The number one factor is incumbency protection, number one. So California is wildly different. I would approach the national model with California and other states that have gone to an independent redistricting commission where communities of interest are what is the most important variable rather than political interests. So I'm very hopeful that uh, we can uh, again, we need a new administration uh, because what I've seen is, uh, unfortunately, the erosion of the Voting Rights Act uh, under this Supreme Court, uh, under this administration. Uh, look no further than what we've seen in uh, many of the recent states uh, that are uh, drawing dramatically unfair uh, district lines. Uh, and I don't need to say specific states. You know which states I'm talking about. Uh, and we need to do everything we can to ensure that we, I believe, take back the White House to uh, for one of many reasons, to make sure that we have a Supreme Court uh, that actually is looking at voting rights uh, as, uh, you know, the intent of the Voting Rights Act was, was uh, uh, supposed to be carried out, uh, as opposed to the narrow rights of political interests, which is what I think is happening in some states across the country. So I thank you very much for the question.
Well, my belief is that uh, we have to have continued research and development in all of the above, and uh, we have what's called ARPA-E, the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy. Uh, it is the uh, successor to DARPA that was the defense uh, initiative that led to things like GPS technology and telecommunications and a whole host of other innovations. Uh, RPE is a really important program because they innovate uh, on a whole variety of technologies. How to make solar panels more efficient with different materials. How to make uh, batteries uh, that are cheaper and that are more scalable than the ones that we have today. Uh, all We need it all. <laughs> That's the short answer. Uh, from an economic perspective, sometimes you hear, particularly from some of my friends, and they are my friends on the other side, about the cost of trying to have sustainable energy, right? You hear, oh, this is gonna cost us so much. What they don't like to talk about as much is the cost of doing nothing. If we continue on the course that we're on, it's estimated that over the next uh, century, so from now to the end of the century, uh, the cost of inaction is anywhere between 15 and 38 trillion dollars with a T. That's the cost of doing nothing. That's the cost on our human health, our safety, our economic productivity, uh, and you can see climate change. We don't have to go very far to see the impact of climate change. Just go down to Capitol Beach, uh, where you see structures that 60, 70 years have been there, but are not there anymore. Or go down to uh, the other parts of my district in Del Mar and Solana Beach, where you see coastal erosion that's really unprecedented uh, over the, the recent decades, where we, now we have to take the Amtrak and Metrolink lines and put them uh, inland uh, because of the, the bluff erosion. Go down to Imperial Beach, uh, where you see high tide that's higher than it's been, uh, and where you see ocean temperatures. The Scripps Institute of Oceanography and the folks at UC San Diego, they know that what we're seeing in our oceans, what we're seeing in our coastline, uh, are uh, truly unprecedented circumstances that if we do not dramatically reduce our greenhouse gas footprint, we are going to suffer tremendously. E economically, we're going to suffer tremendously. Now, we can turn this into an economic win. Because if we create the clean energy industry, and if we lead on clean energy, we're going to have a tremendous wealth creation opportunity. I would argue it's the greatest wealth creation opportunity our generation has. And we have two choices as I see it. And I've said this before, and I'll keep saying it because it's important. Either we're going to lead on clean energy or we're going to follow. If we lead and we continue on research and development and deployment of the clean energy technologies of the future, then we're going to get those jobs, that economic activity, those great companies, they'll be here. And the world over, they'll be using the technologies that are developed and deployed here in the United States. And we've done that in every other industrial revolution until now. On the other hand, 30 more seconds. On the other hand, the alternative is that China, India, other countries, they lead. They invent those technologies, or even worse is uh, students will come from China and India to our research universities, go back and create those companies in China and India because our immigration laws are broken. And then those companies will develop and deploy those technologies there first. Then we'll be behind and we'll be using them because we have to. And those other countries will gain economically and we will miss that opportunity. That's what this is about. So we got to get it right. We got to get it right. Thank you.
Excellent question. I'm glad you got out of the $200,000 in uh, medical bills. Uh, and I'm glad that you're doing okay. And I'm glad the Affordable Care Act actually worked. Uh, I was with President Obama. He met with the freshman, and we asked him, was it all worth it? And specifically, was it worth being away from your wife and your kids? And he said, well, the only thing that made it worth it to a degree, because it's uncertain to him whether it really was or wasn't, which is amazing when you think about it. He said the celebrity didn't do it, the magazine covers, none of that being famous, none of that did it. If you wanted to be famous, he said, go to Hollywood. But what did it was the story like yours, where he would, you know, he would hear from a uh, person who maybe themselves or their son or their daughter benefited from the Affordable Care Act in that way. Uh, so just know that that's why we do this sort of thing. Uh, hopefully we get it right more than we get it wrong, and hopefully we help some people along the way. And consistent with that is my belief that, it's what I said before, the rule of law has to apply to everybody. If people break the law, it doesn't matter whether they're an FBI agent, the President of the United States, the law has to be applied uh, in an even-handed way and in a uh, nonpartisan way. And ultimately, I am concerned right now uh, by the person running the Department of Justice uh, and you know, the fact that he would not come and testify before the House uh, day before yesterday or, or a couple days ago, uh, that gave me great concern. Uh, it also gives me great concern if uh, people are being overly partisan uh, rather than focused on the facts, the Constitution, and the law. Uh, so that's, again, that's what's going to guide my judgment my thinking, uh, and that's what that's the, the oath that we all took, and we have to be even-handed in our administration of the law, uh, and we have to be evidence-based rather than um, politically-based. Does that make sense? My question was more that um, would you be supportive of uh, pushing for the prosecution and imprisonment of the, of the uh, people who may have broken the law when they were in the investigating process? Well, again, I'm, I'm for the equal administration of justice. I'm for the equal administration of justice. So if people broke the law, they should be held to account in a nonpartisan way. Does that make sense? Thank you for the question. as our founders intended. And when we start eroding the freedom of the press, when we start talking about the press as the enemy of the people, uh, that is a very unhealthy and toxic thing for our society. Uh, I know many journalists, they're not perfect, but uh, most of them try to get it right. Uh, most of them are doing their job uh, in a uh, responsible way. Not all of them, and then there are others that don't pretend to be journalists, but rather uh, are more of a, uh, an opinion show, and that comes through pretty clear as well. There are others that sometimes blur those lines, and I wish that they didn't to the extent that they do. Uh, I would, my, my advice for everybody here would be, uh, don't just get your news from one place, and particularly for the high school students here. If you're only getting your news from one place, you're not getting the whole story. I don't care what that one place is. I don't care if it's the New York Times or Breitbart or Fox News, or MSNBC, or CNN. And the other thing I'd say is if you're watching more than like two or three hours of cable news a day, turn it off and go walk outside. We've got a beautiful place to live here. Go see some flowers, go see the ocean. Uh, there's more to life than 24-hour cable news. 
Uh, I frequently turn down the opportunity to go on national cable news to be part of the partisan food fight because I don't think it's healthy for our democracy to foment division and hatred in our society, regardless of where it's coming from. Uh, and I hope you agree with that. That's why you're not going to see me as a talking head all the time. Uh, I'm not saying I'll never go on. I'll go on, if, hopefully, if I can go, go on about things that I know about or about things that are directly germane uh, to the interests of our community, our region, our district. If they want to talk about climate change, if they want to talk about issues on our border, cross-border trade as an example, is a quarter of a trillion dollars a year in the greater Southern California region. I'll go and I'll talk about the importance of that. But just to go as part of the partisan food fight, that's not for me. Maybe for some of my colleagues, definitely for some of my colleagues. I wouldn't group Assange with all of those journalists. I think Assange is a unique case. I think sources and methods were not done uh, to normal journalistic standards. Uh, I do think uh, that uh, disclosure of information uh, that uh, otherwise would necessarily be permitted uh, in a normal journalistic environment uh, is a big concern. Uh, I follow what happened very closely. I want to prevent uh, the next WikiLeaks uh, from occurring. Uh, to the extent that uh, there was information that was used uh, that was provided from Russia or from the GRU, I'm very concerned that it was used to try to influence uh, the 2016 election. I'm concerned it'll be used to try to influence the 2020 election. We've all got to be mindful of the fact that there's been very little to do, or very little done, uh, about election security. We have passed, the House has passed through HR1 specific measures to try to prevent the interference in our election by foreign entities. And the Senate will not take up the bill. They won't even hold a hearing on that bill, and I wish that they would. And I thank you for the question. Thank you. Wow, that's working now. Okay, um, because we've had a number of adults up here and not as many students, I'm going to call out a couple of numbers and raise your hand if it's yours. Okay, so I can see. If, I want to get some students up here instead. Okay, 088. Who is it? Okay. Nobody. <laughs> okay. If you're not present, you can't. 088. Win, right? Yeah, 056. Okay, come on up. Hustle up. Zero six zero. Okay, <laughs> you're gonna have to wait. You're young at heart, uh, right? Yeah. Um, so we're gonna ask you to wait. Zero five nine. Okay, okay. come on up. <laughs> another one. Another one. And zero eight seven. Who is zero eight seven? Oh man, we're okay. Try to huh? And. Zero four one. You know, I hate to t say this, but you graduated from high school a really long time ago. <laughs> what, just, I didn't do this, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's why I'm doing this tonight. Okay, zero five one. Okay, got it. Hi, my name is Michaela Walters and I'm from Ladera Ranch. Um, I wanted to bring back the issue of San Onofre and I wanted to ask you about um, the legislation you're working towards writing on the removal of nuclear waste um, from San Onofre and more specifically about the impact it will have on the economy, whether that be positively or negatively. It's a great question. So I look at it from a local economic perspective and I'm deeply concerned uh, that if we were to have an incident that it could have a dramatic negative impact on our, on, on our economy. Uh, contrasting that is the view of those in Texas who see an economic opportunity to manage the waste, which I think is very interesting. Everybody knows that if you were to go and pick where you'd want to put a nuclear power plant, like today, you wouldn't pick San Onofre. <laughs> I think everybody gets that, right? Two earthquake faults, uh, 8.3 million people within 50 miles, and it was never designed uh, either at San Onofre or many of the spent fuel facilities all across the, the country that there's about a hundred of them incidentally uh, where the, the waste is stored next to uh, where the reactors are. That wasn't the intent. We were supposed to have a permanent repository and that waste was supposed to go all across the country was supposed to go to that repository. Now, back in August of last year, there was an incident 
uh, where one of the canisters, as it was being uh, moved into its concrete to store it, uh, nearly fell 18 feet. And had that happened, there is a real uh, divergence of scientific opinion on what the outcome would have been. There are some who say it would have been a localized, could have been a localized radioactive leak. There are others who believe it would have been more, more serious, and there are others who say that it uh, wouldn't have been an issue at all. That's not a chance I want to take. Not when you have 8.3 million people within a 50 mile radius. And so I think it's imperative that we get the waste off the coast. We also know that we're overdue for an earthquake. There have been many articles written, I believe there was one in the register not long ago about, or it was, I think it was the LA Times, about how long it's been since we've had a significant earthquake. We know as part of the deal of living where we live in this beautiful place with the ocean and uh, all the other great things that we have here, that we have earthquakes and that we have a lot of people. And that's just part of the deal. So we don't need spent nuclear fuel there. So my first order of business is to try to pass a uh, bill to prioritize waste, not just in San Onofre, but certainly including San Onofre, the movement of that waste when you've got more people or when you've got seismic activity or other environmental factors that are outside of the norm. Does that make sense? Great, thank you very much for the question. Hi, my name's Ian Foon. I'm a junior at San Juan Hills High School. You related? Yes, okay, all right, fantastic. So here's, I'm gonna embarrass your sister very briefly. So she did an incredible amount of work on our campaign. She, when we first started, we were doing our phone banks out of my house, and my wife was there, Olivia was there helping to run those phone banks. I still remember that very well. Now she's off at my alma mater, Stanford University, proud graduate of this high school, and she's gonna do great things at Stanford. So be very proud of your sister, okay? So a group of fr my friends and I, we visit the Theo Lacey and James Music detention facilities around here, and we visit uh, asylum seekers who have been detained and are currently there. And we were recently informed that ICE has broken their contract with the detention centers and that they will no longer be holding asylum seekers at either of the two facilities and that they will be moved out within 90 days. And I was kind of wondering what possible solutions you might think we could have in that uh, asylum seekers would be able to be housed and um, near to where they were trying to come in. So I'm deeply concerned uh, by this, and I'm grateful to Governor Newsom for providing $25 million uh, to uh, help with the issue. Uh, we have in uh, South San Diego uh, a facility where uh, they currently house those seeking asylum, seeking shelter, uh, in the interim before that they, before their, uh, ultimately their, their case is resolved. Uh, and the other lie that's out there is that these people don't show up uh, to, uh, you know, have their case heard before a judge when it's their turn. They actually do at a higher rate than probation seekers as a whole, or, or those, who, those on probation as a whole. Uh, so I think that's another big piece of misinformation. Uh, the shelter that they're building in San Diego right now, uh, or that they're, they're retrofitting an existing building in San, San Diego to serve as an asylum uh, shelter, refugee shelter, I think could be a good model. We have to see how it works. I know the folks at Jewish Family Services, JFS, that are deeply involved in that, as are a variety of other nonprofit organizations in partnership with the County of San Diego. I'm very proud of my friends at the county level, uh, including my friend Nathan Fletcher and others who made that happen. And I'm gonna be following it closely. If there's a model there that can be adopted by other counties, including the County of Orange, I'll certainly uh, convey that to our friends. And I have a good working relationship uh, with Lisa Bartlett. I'm, I'm very happy to report that. Uh, and I think that uh, you know, we're gonna work together, we're gonna do the best that we can. It's not an easy issue. And again, the policies that come from the top uh, either exacerbate the problem or begin to address it. And I worry that we're making the problem worse than it already is with some of the policies that we're putting in place. I'm gonna be asking McAleenan about that uh, when that meeting occurs. Thank you for the question. Thank you. I think the students have some pretty good questions. 
I'm impressed. So, Congressman, this is your last question. We're going to go a little bit over, if that's okay with you, because we got a little late start. How I will go as long as Ellen Montanari wants me to go. <laughs> Are you all okay with that? Okay. Okay, so um, before we get to that last question, for any of you who did not get your questions asked, um, where's the guy that I would give a hard time to? Is that, would that be your husband? Yeah? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, feel free to turn your tickets in at the back. Um, we'll have ushers back there. Ushers, if you are still sitting in here, it's time for you to go back by the doors. And uh, you're going to turn in your eval card, um, if you would please, because we're always trying to improve these. So let us know how we can improve it. And then also, if you have your, um, your question on a card, turn it in. Make sure your name, address, phone number, and email address are on it. And someone will get back to you with an answer to your question. It won't be right away. The staff is very small, and he's still building his staff um, here in the district, so please but be patient. But if it's not fast enough, let us know that too, <laughs> because we, we will try to do our very best to be responsive. And you have my contact information, because I'm the one who sent you all of those emails about your, um, your tickets. So, um, and students, um, we also will have Raising Canes out in the, the side over here for you. Um, and for those of you who are not students, you, all you wannabes out there, um, after the students have eaten and if there's food left over, you are more than welcome to take some <laughs> also, okay? So, um, on that, oh, and Olivia, before, again, because I know what's going to happen is after the last question, y'all are going to leave, so Olivia had something to say. Yeah, hi again, thanks for everyone for coming. Um, I just also wanted to say that this event wouldn't have been possible without a local youth-led nonprofit organization called Soft for Change that helped organize this event and recruit people. So And if uh, you are interested in being able to help put on events like this and um, promoting youth empowerment and civic engagement in the community, find uh, Ava over here with a Sock for Change shirt, or anybody else with a Sock for Change shirt or pin. Can I say one thing Ava about, I want to say one thing about civic engagement. So in our district, uh, in the 2018 election, we had historically high turnout for midterm election uh, across the country, but particularly in our district, 73% turnout. A lot of that was driven by many young people voting for the first time. And my great hope is that it isn't just a one-time deal, that you vote uh, whenever you can, whenever, you're, whenever the elections are, uh, for the rest of your lives. That's part of our civic duty. Uh, part of our uh, democracy requires uh, each of you to play your part, and that means vote. And more importantly, if you're here, you're going to vote. I'm confident of that. Tell your friends. Tell your, you know, cousins, your co-workers maybe who might not want to vote, your family members, uh, make sure that they vote. Uh, that's the lifeblood of our democracy. If you don't like what you see, locally, state, federal, do something about it and vote. Does that make sense? So simple, but we have to vote. So thank you everybody. So for those of you who don't know about Sock for Change, it's Students of Orange County for Change, so you know what it stands for. And Congressman, I think you'd be pleased to know that there are more students here than there are what we call general admission, which is our polite way of saying adults. So well, anyway, congratulations to all of you. Absolutely. Thank you. I'd love to see you all. Okay, now for your last question. How's it going, Congressman? Good, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing pretty well. Um, so, I'm, I'm Eric Colborn, in case you forgot. I was at your last town hall as well, so good to see you again. Um, on your campaign website, you said that you were in favor of an assault weapons ban. So with that in mind, will you commit to supporting legislation that bans all semi-automatic assault weapons to help curtail the gun violence that has gotten so extreme in recent years in our state and in our country? Yes, and David Cicilline, my friend from Rhode Island, is introducing legislation. I'll proudly co-sponsor that legislation. Uh, I think that uh, just last week we saw another AR-15 that was used uh, in the uh, Chabad of Poway. So we've got to do something. We can't just offer thoughts and prayers again and again and expect things to change. We've got to be the change that we seek. 
It was Gabby Giffords. Everybody knows Gabby Giffords. Her husband, Mark Kelly, is now running for U.S. Senate in Arizona. I think he'd be a great senator, by the way. And she said, if Congress will not take action to prevent gun violence, it's time to elect a different Congress. Now, we elected a different House of Representatives, but we still have Mitch McConnell in charge of the Senate. If we were to pass any gun legislation, uh, and it wasn't just HRA. I mentioned HRA at the beginning. That's universal background checks. That is around 85 to 90 percent of the public wants to see universal background checks for gun purchases. We also passed something called HR 1121 to close what's known as the Charleston loophole. You might remember there was a horrible shooting in Charleston, South Carolina, killed a number of people. The killer, uh, Dylan uh, Roof, he. Uh, Five days into a FBI background check that hadn't yet been completed, he bought the weapon that he used to kill uh, in that tragedy. All that bill says is if your FBI background check is not completed, you can't buy a gun until it is. And that ought to be a simple thing as well. And we passed that bill in the House also. And yet, uh, despite the pleas from uh, so many people across this country, a lot of students, the March for Our Lives, Moms Demand Action, the Brady Campaign, the Giffords Campaign, they won't, in the Senate, Mitch McConnell won't even hold a hearing. Forget about even voting for it. He won't even hold a hearing on it. So we need to collectively demand that he does. And if he, if he won't, then we've got to elect a new Senate. And ultimately, we need a president of the United States who will act. And we have far too many. I mentioned the oil companies. I mentioned some others. We also have far too many members of Congress who are bought by the National Rifle Association. I don't believe they represent the interests of most of the gun owners that I know. I think they represent a handful of gun, the interests of a handful of gun manufacturers. So we've got to get it right, and that requires, unfortunately, I have to tell you, it requires a new president, it requires a new Senate, working in tandem with the, with the House that we've elected, keeping the House. And then things like H.R. 8, H.R. 1121, and other pieces of legislation can actually become law, and we can make our communities safer, because when you go to a school like this, you deserve to feel safe. That's what this is about. And thank you for your question. Can we give a big round of a hand, a hand to hand to Olivia and to all the students that made this possible? I'm incredibly grateful to you for leading. You give me hope, and I'm grateful to everybody for being here. Thank you all very much.